This has been a question been bothering me for a long time. To your expertise opinion, uh, that right now, how do we uh, fight in the conflicts between reality and the cyber world in the sense of, for example, to keep language usage properly? You know, back in the old days, when you see something that is printed on paper, be it a newspaper, be it a poet book, be it whatever, even a textbook or a magazine, you can be sure they are language at least grammatically right. Now, everybody, as long as you have fingers, you can create anything on the computer. You can become a, po a poet within 10 minutes as long as you hit your return key every two words. Now, how are we supposed to face the next generation when this goes into an influx that the, when language usage is being hugely and uh, tremendously and dangerously challenged to your educational expertise, please? I wonder, <laughs> this, 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 this looks like a, a perfect question for Google. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, I, I wrote three books in Chinese, and I've only finished elementary school in, in, the Chi in, in Taiwan. So people ask me how I do that. Well, a lot of the usage, I actually do use Google. You know, when I think of... Uh, <laughs> When I want to write about a Confucian quote, and I only remember like two, you know, five words out of 20, I just put it <laughs> to Google and it tells me the rest. Sure. When I want to think of, uh, you know, 成语,然后记不太清楚. So I use a, a portion of it, and I use, when I have, you know, things like 关门弟子,闭门弟子, which one is right? I do both in Google and see which one gives me more results. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but, but I do want to challenge the premise of the question a little bit, which is I think the power of expression of the internet is so much more value than any level of reduced um, uh, for grammatical formality. Um, so personally, I like to improve the grammar and language usage, but I think the, I, we shouldn't question the value of the internet and the power of expression it grants people. It's so much more powerful, and I hope we accept that, and then on that basis, try to improve the usage if we can. Thank you. I have a question. I have the power of the mic, too. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure got uh, the microphone. So. Carolyn Chin, committee, member, uh, committee 100 member. Uh, universities such as MIT and Harvard have put the coursework on the internet. China is one of the largest internet user countries. Have we, or is anybody taking a look of the potential of technology to change the models of education in a place like China, not only at the university level, but you know, broadly throughout the country. I mean, out of a box thinking, new type of thinking. Uh, I can Any? probably help answer okay, this. Uh, on the one hand, if you look at just totally online, the Chinese uh, universities, there are in fact online open universities in China. But one of the problem with China in terms of people's psychic is that they don't consider that's really as good a degree. So money, in, as a result, it has really not been taking off amount of major universities that I know. Uh, on the other hand, your point is very well taken care of. In terms of globalizing Chinese universities, I think the interactions between uh, Chinese universities over, and university overseas uh, going beyond the person to, uh, sort of person to person interactions online course uh, course lo downloading could play a tremendous ro role so I can see that looking forward uh, there will be a lot more pos uh, that kind of possibilities so one, one comment on the open courseware um, that actually has, has tremendous usage in China uh, a lot of students have found out about it particularly the MIT open courseware um, and there are actually two volunteer organizations that translate it to Chinese. One is called OOPS and one is called CORE. And I think they're doing a tremendous uh, thing for the Chinese students who are really flocking to either the English side or the Chinese side. Thank you. Oh, hey, hey. Okay, Pauline. You don't have the mic. <laughs> Pauline you, another uh, Committee of 100 member. I have a question about the curriculum of the global university. I, I, we've been talking about 
primarily um, science and technology as the sort of core of the global university, and, and it's not surprising giving, given our distinguished panel and the fact that sciences are, have been globalized disciplines for some time. But if you think about the, the strength of the American system, which is argu arguably still the gold standard, it's based on a commitment to the liberal arts and sciences, and um, certainly think about the, um, a lot of the values that and, and um, uh, uh, goals that and important uh, emphases that you've in mentioned on, on the panel of history, culture, um, values, uh, communication, all sorts of good stuff that the humanities provide. I'm just wondering, um, practically speaking and realistically speaking, is there a place for the humanities in the global university? Well, in, in, in China, we, I, I'm not supposed to, uh, to answer questions, <laughs> but, uh, but in, 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 in China, we emphasize this zhen san mei, this mei, the arts, the humanities above all. So that's, uh, with, with that note, uh, maybe uh, uh, Professor Yao, you, you, you have been promoting connecting science to humanities, connecting science to, to arts, and all that uh, maybe. Uh, well, uh, I've been interesting in mathematics and trying to relate science and arts. And I think it's very difficult to communicate uh, beauty through internet. And you really need to see face to face to enjoy what is the best. And uh, I read a lot of ancient books and I think uh, the Chinese uh, students uh, should be trained to learn some old Chinese culture and also modern Chinese culture or Western culture. Uh, I found out one thing is that there are a lot of beautiful uh, uh, books in uh, Western world. Very few Chinese students actually know it. And I think it would be very useful to translate them into Chinese. And uh, I think the education system has been mostly uh, uh, trying to train students to, to get a good job. But to learn truth and beauty is not really in their agenda as much as uh, in the elite universities in America, which I think is important. Yeah. Can I say a few sure. words on this? Absolutely. I think one of the uh, <coughs> drivers for globalization is really the cultural benefits that come from the two, a multi-way flow of people and uh, people with different life experiences who go through different uh, educational systems, which therefore bring about this synergy. And, uh, and, and humanities, certain social sciences, history, um, philosophy, uh, certain subjects in humanity have cultural context. And therefore it's more important that uh, as we think of globalizing universities and we think of science and technology, we particularly think in terms of science and technology, and, and indeed I think there's a certain level of objectivity, so-called objectivity in science and technology. But for the humanities and social sciences, you can speak of objectivity, but you can also speak of knowledge in a certain context. And I think that's what's, sol what's solely missing in today's world. I think this is some of the issues, some of the problems that arise that there's in a, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a congested and culturally complex world. I think for us to see a way forward, take on some of the challenges, I think not only looking at science and technology, because science and technology alone will not answer these questions. The issues of societal values, cultural values, uh, uh, issues to do with, um, with our own priorities. And I think unless we come to grips with these issues, I think we're gonna have serious challenges ahead of us. And I, I, I agree that one has to look at our history, at our own societal cultural values. And this will only come when, when universities begin to interact with one another and encourage a multi-way flow of people. Uh, Henry, well, may I sure. add a little bit to this? Uh, before I make a comments, uh, I, I want to point out that maybe our colleague uh, in the fellow committee, 100 member, President Zhang Xingang from Xiangang uh, 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 is in the audience. Maybe he, he is, is currently is, teaching is he here? At, at Beijing University. Well, so why maybe don't you he- stand up? I can see you. Oh, my, welcome. You want yeah. to say something? So maybe he could say something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but any- Anyway, uh, uh, Xingang, I'll give you a couple more minutes to think about it. I, 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 I'll come back to Pauline's question. Uh, Pauline's question that is an excellent question because uh, uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was uh, involved in a 
uh, Higher Education Forum organized by uh, Council on Foreign Relations with all the university presidents, not all, many of the university presidents, one of the questions came uh, on China. And one of the questions that uh, uh, a university president here uh, asked, is there any liberal arts uh, colleges in China? And I can resist and saying no, uh, that's the, really the problem. The Chinese system, if you look at the best universities in China, mostly derive from what I would call uh, a technological university without this proper balance uh, with the humanity size. Uh, I think that's a tremendous uh, handicap. Uh, and small liberal art colleges currently within the current system okay, so, so just couldn't exist.